All right, in the search for ultimate answers, the reason by itself path hit major dead ends. And I've been trying to point that out. I've called that stage five. And the, the major dead end that reason by itself, modernism hit, was their conclusion that there are no ultimate answers. There's no purpose to life. There's no meaning to life. There's no ultimate truth. Now, a lot of people were crushed by this conclusion. Suicide, depression, coming to grips with this conclusion that there is no meaning or purpose to life. And so it caused people to be, in a sense, desperate to try a new path where they could find meaning and purpose. As I said last week, it's kind of like a, a, a cornered animal where they had nowhere else to go. So thinkers and Western culture desperate to avoid this conclusion that there's no meaning to purpose for life came up with a new path. This new path is that meaning and purpose come from within us. So I've summarized it this way. If we can summarize these three eras. Quite simply, as pre-modernism, modernism, and post-modernism, this new path, post-modernism, is the attempt to try to find meaning and purpose, ultimate answers, in ourselves, in here. And this is the key motivation, if you understand this, this is the key motivation which gave birth to postmodernism then. And I don't think people would have tried this path unless they had run into this desperate situation and they were trying to avoid the conclusion of modernism that there was no meaning and purpose to life. So I've called this new path faith by itself. It's irrational faith because it's faith that's been broken away from reason. It has more to do with um, our internal subjective feelings, emotions, desires, passions, and as we'll see tonight, our choices that we make in response to those things. Last week we looked at what I've said is the first postmodern movement known as Romanticism. Romanticism was a huge movement in the early 1800s. It included a lot of literary works, artistic works, but at its root, it was a response, a philosophical response to modernism. And they were reacting against modernism, rejecting a lot of the conclusions of modernism, particularly the Enlightenment thinking of the 1700s. So to summarize romanticism from last week, rom the romantics rejected the idea that reason and science are the ultimate forms of truth, ultimate forms of knowledge. They rejected the idea that the universe is this vast machine, and along with that rejected the idea that humans are just cogs in the machine, robots determined by nature. Instead, what they emphasized was the inner life, the passions, the de desires, the emotions. Part and parcel with this, they emphasized individual creativity and individual spirituality. That was a big part of this movement, Romanticism in the early 1800s. As I mentioned, I agree with a lot of their critique of modernism. That's something that's kind of interesting here. As a, as a pre-modern thinker, I can kind of join hands with the postmodernists as they critique modernism, because I critique modernism too, and there's a sense in which, as a pre-modern thinker, I can kind of hold hands with modernism as they critique postmodernism, because I also critique postmodernism. So it, it results in some of these interesting situations. Even though I can affirm some of the critiques of modernism posed by the Romantics, I think the Romantic thinkers took their conclusions too far. They overreacted and ended up doing damage 
um, going too far the other way by putting truth and meaning only inside of us. Uh, interesting book I wanted to bring to your attention. This is a book explaining postmodernism, skepticism and socialism from Rousseau to uh, Foucault by Stephen R.C. Hicks. Now he is a professor of philosophy at Rockford University in Illinois and he got his PhD from Indiana University in Bloomington. Now the reason I want to recommend this book is he writes from a modern position. So he's a modernist, okay? But this book is a critique of postmodernism that I can largely get behind. There are some places in the book where he critiques uh, pre-modernism, which I would disagree with, obviously. So him and I would disagree when it comes to his modernism versus my pre-modernism. But we would be, uh, Dr. Hicks and I would be completely on board and in agreement in our critique of postmodernism. So I found this book to be extremely helpful, and it goes through the you know, last five, six hundred years of the history of philosophy, kind of like we're doing in this class. And he goes through some of the same material and does it really well. He talks about some of the thinkers that we just don't have time to talk about in this class. And what's what I really like about this book is that he shows, he has a chapter about how postmodern thinking influenced art, kind of like we talked about a couple of weeks ago. But he also ha spends a lot of time in this book showing how this sort of postmodern thinking influence political thought. So if anybody's writing their paper in terms of how philosophy is impact, has, has impacted political theory, this would be a great book. And he has a lot of good quotes, a lot of original or um, quotes from primary sources where he's quoting these folks and shows how a lot of the social political theory, socialism, communism, Nazism, fascism, all of those social group political theories are intertwined with postmodern thought, going back in particular to Rousseau in the 1700s. So very well laid out, goes through a lot of the same type of history that we do in this class, but this would be a, a great book I would recommend to go along with, with this class, or if you're um, writing your paper. Um, especially on political theory. So what I want to do tonight is focus on one thinker in particular during this early 1800s period. And some people have placed this individual with the Romantics. You can make that argument. You can reject that. That's fine. But this gentleman, Soren Kierkegaard, was a, a major thinker in the early 1800s. So at a minimum, he was writing and thinking and, and doing his work during the Romantic era, even if he's maybe not technically a Romantic. Some people say yes, some people say he isn't. But what he has been is a huge influence in Western thinking as a very outspoken critic of reason. So even if he isn't technically a Romantic thinker, he was saying a lot of the same things that they were, criticizing reason in particular. So according to Kierkegaard, philosophers in the past had tried to discover truth and meaning out there somewhere. They used observation, they used reason, they used evidence, and Kierkegaard said they were looking for meaning in all the wrong places. They were looking for meaning out there somewhere in the world. And he said, that's not where meaning is found. Meaning is not found by observing the world out there or reasoning about it. To discover what's meaningful, turn inward to yourself. Because inside yourself is where you'll, you'll find things that are meaningful the things you're passionate about, the things you desire, 
the commitments of your heart, so to speak, that's where you'll find meaningful things, not out in the world, but in here, according to Kierkegaard. So some of the things that he emphasized, he emphasized the individual, like the Romantics, right? Very focused on the individual and their personal experiences of life, the things that they go through and experience as an individual. He proposed these uh, stages of attaining selfhood, which sounds um, quite lofty, but it's, it's kind of the idea that a lot of people talk about today of finding yourself, right? You know, it's kind of a, a common motif that people refer to or talk about. They're, they're trying to find themselves. And that a lot of that language and ideas can be traced back to Kierkegaard and his proposal that we go through these stages of attaining our true selves, finding ourselves, so to speak. Now, Kierkegaard said, you know, if you want to use reason to understand the external world, that's fine. Okay, if you want to use reason and evidence and science to try to understand the objective external world, that's okay. No problem with that. But those things, the external world and your reason, those things can't help you understand what it means to be human. That has to come from within. Because human life isn't about dry, boring, calculated reason. Human life is about chasing our, our passions, fulfilling our desires, and getting frustrated when we don't when we're not able to do that. That's what life is about. And science is just no help when it comes to those sort of things. So he kind of flips the tables, right, on the Enlightenment modern way of thinking. The Enlightenment modern way of thinking elevated reason as the highest form of knowledge. And Kierkegaard, like many of the Romantics, said that science is actually a lesser type of knowledge. Science isn't a very important type of knowledge. So a quote from Kierkegaard, he said that life, human life, is not a scientific problem to be solved, but a reality to be experienced. Ultimate meaning is subjective. It has to do with an individual's passions and desires. And for him, and a lot of others during this era, this was a type of faith a type of belief or a, a way of believing, not based on reason, but based on these emotions and passions. This was the highest virtue somebody could accomplish or reach, was fulfilling their desires, chasing their passions. This is what was necessary for the most fulfillment in life, meaning to life. And it was so individualistic, it was different for each person, so much so that it couldn't even be communicated. So this meaning that you had, this, uh, your meaning to life, what you were passionate about in life, was so personal and so individual, it couldn't even be communicated to another person. It's just something that you experienced internally on your own. So you should exist in that passion. You should exist in that truth. Embody it, if you will. Live in it. Part of Kierkegaard's philosophy was putting a huge emphasis on our choices. So a, a key knowledge that we could attain as we get to know ourselves and understand ourselves, find ourselves, is to understand the choices that we make in response to our experiences. In fact, he would go as far to say that truth, your truth, is generated by the choices you make in response to your personal experiences. So, he wrote things like this. A man who, as a physical being, is always turned toward the outside thinking that his happiness lies outside him, finally turns inward and discovers that the source is within him. 
So ultimate truth isn't out there. Ultimate truth is created by your choices of what you do in response to your experiences. So there's a sense in which your choices create your meaning. Your choices create your purpose in your life. Here's another quote from Kierkegaard. He wrote, What I really lack is to be clear in my mind what I am to do, not what I am to know. It's not about, you know, scientific knowledge, reason, knowledge based on reason and evidence, but what I should do. Find a truth that is, here we go, true for me. And what does he mean by that? Well, he's talking about the ideas which I'm passionate about, um, the ideas that I'm willing to die for, what really gets me going, what really inflames my passion and burns my heart. That's what's true for me. And then to act on those, that's where meaning comes from. So, you know, what he's getting at here is what ideas are you passionate about? What ideas are you willing to die for? For. And whatever those ideas are, that's what's true for you. That's your truth, what you're passionate about. So it's a completely different way of thinking of truth as what corresponds to reality. Normally, you know, at least before postmodernism, and postmodern and even modern thinkers still would understand truth this way. That if something is true, it's what corresponds to reality. So if one of my sons comes into my office and says, Dad, I can't mow the lawn because it's raining outside. And if I would ask them, son, is that true? What I'm asking is that what they've described, raining outside, corresponds to reality. Is, it, is that what's really happening out there? Is that what's really true? And so a redefinition of truth is going on here where now truth, ultimate truth at least, becomes what you're passionate about. That's why you know, Kierkegaard is able to say something can be true for me but not true for you. What he means by that is I'm passionate about XYZ and maybe you're not passionate about XYZ so it's not true for you. So it's kind of a redefinition of the whole idea of truth. Now, he's well known uh, and associated with this phrase, taking a leap of faith. You've probably heard that phrase before. Um, it might not even necessarily be a phrase that can be traced back to him, but it has become associated with his philosophy, taking a leap of faith. And it fits well, and a lot of his followers later and those who promoted his way of thinking use that term to describe his thinking and his philosophy, and then use that phrase to advocate their own positions. So this idea of taking a leap of faith. And what he means by this, of course, is not what a pre-modern person would say faith is. According to pre-modernism, as we've studied, faith is trusting something based on good reasons and evidence. This idea of faith, this taking a leap of faith, is a personal choice to create meaning for yourself based on what you're passionate about. And this is really the epitome of faith by itself. So these aren't, you know, when I call this movement, postmodernism, this path, faith by itself, those aren't my words. I'm, I'm taking words and phrases from these thinkers. Um, I'm using their own language to describe their philosophy. Faith by itself, taking a leap of faith. Now, of course, like all these ideas that we've been studying, his ideas in this postmodern way of thinking has been communicated down through art, all forms of art in the last 200 years. And I just want to show you one example of that. You know, my favorite form of art is movies, and so I have a lot of movie references. And I see this way of thinking in so many movies. Uh, the end of Guardians of the Galaxy 2 really communicates this way of thinking very strongly. 
Um, but the example I'm going to show you is from the final Matrix movie. So a big fan of the Matrix movies. I, I really enjoy them. I think they were really well done, at least, at least the original. But this scene is from the third and final Matrix movie. Although I heard they're making a fourth one, so I guess it won't be final for too long. But this is from the third one. This is the big climactic battle, if you haven't seen the movie. The big climactic battle between the machines and the humans. And Agent Smith, down here on the bottom right, he's a robot, a machine, to simplify it. And he, he is saying this to Neo, who's up in the top left, the human hero. He's saying this to him, okay? So I'm going to read this quote. This is from the robot, the machine, in the movie. Agent Smith, the evil robot, he says, Do you believe you're fighting for something, Neo? human? Do you, do you believe you're fighting for something more than your survival? Can you tell me what it is? Do you even know? Is it freedom or truth? Perhaps peace? Could it be for love? These are illusions, Mr. Anderson. That's Neo's name, Mr. Anderson. These are temporary constructs of a feeble human intellect trying desperately to justify an existence that is without meaning or purpose. And all of them are as artificial as the Matrix itself. It's pointless to keep fighting. Why, Mr. Anderson? Why? Why do you persist? So again, these are just actors. They've been given these lines by the writers. But think about, for a moment here, the writers who wrote these lines for the evil robot. What... Going back to my chart of six stages, what stage do the writers have the evil robot representing? Yeah, stage five. And so the writers are using uh, the evil robot to represent stage five very clearly. I mean, think about it. No meaning, no purpose. All that life is really about is survival. You know, evolution has just programmed us based on what led to greatest chances for, for survival and reproduction. I mean, it's so crystal clear that the writers are having Agent Smith, the evil machine robot, <laughs> of all things, communicate stage five, represent stage five. There's no meaning. There's no purpose. All those things you think you're fighting for, you think is meaning in your life, freedom, Peace, love, they're just illusions. There is no meaning and purpose. Clearly a representation of stage five. And does anybody remember uh, Neo's response to stage five thinking? The human, top left, the human, the good guy, he responds to stage five. Does anybody remember what he said? Because I choose to. So this is clearly a, a Kierkegaardian response to stage five. This is Kierkegaard's solution to the meaningless and the hopelessness and the purposelessness of stage five. That I'm going to choose to believe these things. And it's an irrational thing to believe. I, I, they don't have reasons. Think back to the interstellar clip and Hathaway's character. She's this to the actress, it's the writer who put the words in her mouth. But she doesn't have an explanation for why she believes in love, but she's just going to take a leap. She's just going to choose to do it. And that's exactly what uh, the writers put here in Neo's mouth here. I'm just going to choose to believe these things. The same, uh, almost exact same conversation happens in Ridley Scott's uh, Prometheus movie that came out mm, five, ten years ago. It was a prequel to the Alien franchise, but uh, uh, the main character, the, the female girl, the female human, the hero, has the almost exact same position. She's a Christian, she wears a cross, and her husband is not a religious person and really challenges her on how 
she could believe those things. And, she's, and she takes a leap of faith. She takes a Kierkegaardian leap of faith and says, I just choose to believe. And so this is communicated over the last 200 years in all sorts of different art forms, this Kierkegaardian way of thinking. The difference, of course, with a pre-modern position would be a pre-modern thinker like myself would say, I do believe in love, I do believe in peace, I believe in these things, but I'm not taking a leap of faith, an irrational leap of faith to believe in these things. I believe that I have good reasons and evidence to believe in love and meaning and purpose. So that's the difference between a pre-modern thinker like myself compared to this postmodern Kierkegaardian position. Well, let's wrap up uh, Kierkegaard here. Kierkegaard was a, a very large critic of organized religion, much like the Romantics. He emphasized individual spirituality. In this sense, he was very similar to David Hume, in that they were both Hume, Kierkegaard and Hume were critical of rational Christianity, organized religion. He, like the Romantics, said that modernism was not leading to moral or spiritual progress like it thought it would. Remember the optimism of modernism? He said no. All this, the urban life, the cities, the reason, the science is not helping us spiritually or morally, it's actually hurting us. So he's very well known for his attacks against the Danish state church where he lived. He criticized the state church as just being about doctrine, um, rituals, external rituals that didn't really touch the heart. They were just rigid, systemat systematizing their doctrines and beliefs, whereas he was emphasizing the inner heart, the passion. What you're, what you're in love with, not just these beliefs based on reasons and doctrines. Unlike the pre-modern thinkers then, he said that religion, religious faith was not compatible with, with reason, that religious faith is irrational because religion includes irrational ideas. He said religion, by the very nature of it, includes contradictions and things internal to the religion that can't be reconciled. And so if you're going to, to have a religious faith, it's got to be an irrational leap of faith to accept these contradictions, to accept these things that can't be reconciled. So you don't, if you are going to have a religious faith, it's not based on reason and evidence, but it's an irrational leap of faith to believe these contradictions and, and things within the religion. And you take that leap of faith based on passions, your, your passions, your emotions, your desires, what you're passionate about. So let's just talk about Kierkegaard himself. Um, what was true for him? If he's talking about finding your truth, finding what you're passionate about, you know, that was his advice to others, but what was true for him? What was he passionate about? Does anybody know what gave him meaning to life or guesses? Yeah, so he was um, a Christian of sorts. What he found meaningful in life was Jesus Christ. Now, I, when I teach about Kierkegaard, I, I, I don't start with that fact because it seems like, at least for Christians, if they know that he found meaning in Jesus, then they're more willing to overlook his bad philosophy, right? They're more willing to overlook or not criticize his way of thinking as much if they know that what he found meaning in was, was Jesus. So I wanted you to understand his system or to see his philosophy first before you uh, knew that what he put his meaning or irrational faith in was Jesus. 
because I didn't want that to distort your um, evaluation of his philosophy. So he would say things like this about his uh, Christian faith. Again, it's, <laughs> it's not faith as I would explain faith, believing in something based on good reasons and evidence. For him, his Christian faith, I'll let him describe it. He said to have faith in Christianity and Jesus, to have faith in Jesus is to lose your mind and to win God. So again, reason is not helpful here. In fact, reason is harmful. He wrote that the fact that Christianity is contrary to reason is the necessary precondition for true faith. When you realize that Christianity is irrational, has contradictions, there's you know, not good reasons and evidence for it, that's actually a good thing because then you can have true faith. Then you can take this irrational leap of faith when you realize it's just full of contradictions and doesn't have good reasons and evidence for it. So you see it's a completely different way of thinking than a pre-modern understanding of faith. Now, I'm thankful that he put his faith in Christ. I, I, I'm so... I'm concerned that... I don't know if Kierkegaard's going to be in heaven or not when we get there. He might, he might not be. My concern for him, just as a, as a, as a person, is his conception of faith was so distorted when he said he had faith in Jesus, I, I don't know if what he's describing as faith is actually real saving faith. Um, because it's this completely distorted, twisted, irrational leap of faith. Now maybe it is a saving faith, maybe it, it did uh, bring him forgiveness and reconciliation with God. As Jesus promised, anybody who trusts him, puts their faith in Jesus will be forgiven. So maybe um, Kierkegaard was forgiven. But I, it, my concern for him or anybody who would try to believe in Christianity through this ir irrational leap of faith, it just makes me wonder if what they're doing is really what faith is according to what Jesus meant when he said to put our faith in him. I, I don't know the answer to some of those things. But regardless, whether, you know, I'm right or wrong about this, uh, regardless of whether Kierkegaard was a true Christian or not, I think we can safely evaluate his philosophy and point out that it was just wrong and, and bad and very harmful. Because what happened, you know, even if, let's say, uh, he put his faith in Christ, other people came along later and used his philosophy to put their faith in whatever it was that gave them meaning or purpose or they were passionate about. So you could, you could take his philosophy and just, you know, cut Christ out of it and put in something else, Buddhism or rock climbing, if that's what you're passionate about, or anything that you're passionate about, you just insert that into his philosophy, and then that's what provides meaning and purpose to you. So Buddhism could be true for you, but for Kierkegaard, it's not true for him. Um, Christianity is true for him. And so to understand Christianity as, as true in that sense, I don't know if you're really trusting it. It seems like you're just, you're almost, you're just using it to make yourself feel better, but you're not really trusting it in the true sense of the word, as, as I would understand Jesus meant trust or faith. Another movie that illustrates this very, very well is a movie called The Life of Pi. So if you enjoy movies, you enjoy that art form, I would encourage you to watch The Life of Pi. And The Life of Pi, the entire movie, not just a clip, like I've talked about clips from Guardians of the Galaxy 2, the end of that movie, The Matrix, the entire movie of the life of Pi is promoting this sort of thinking. And what happens in the life of Pi, a journalist, a reporter, is going to go meet with somebody 
And everybody says, once you meet with this person, by the time you're done talking with them, you'll believe in God. And the journalist, the reporter is very skeptical. He doesn't believe that there is a God. But everybody tells him, after you go and talk to this guy named Pi, by the end of your conversation, you'll believe in God. And I won't ruin the movie for you, but the movie goes on and basically what's presented to him at the end is um, that there is no God, but you should take a leap of faith to believe there is a God because that will make you feel better about life. So objectively, there is no, this is the message of the movie, objectively there is no God out there. No God exists. But you should believe that there is because that will make you feel, that will, that will give meaning to your life. So take this leap of faith. And again, I just don't know how a faith like that could actually save somebody, could actually be true Christian faith. When you're thinking there is no God, but I'm just going to believe there is anyway because that helps me with life, that doesn't seem like saving faith to me. Okay, last thing I want to say about Kierkegaard is one of his most famous examples. And this is, I think, really helpful to understand Kierkegaard's philosophy. His famous example of using Abraham uh, as an example of what he's getting at, okay? So think with me through the story of Abraham being commanded by God to kill his son Isaac, okay? And Kierkegaard is very famous for using this example to show how faith is an irrational choice to believe against reason and evidence, okay, to believe contradictions. So think about the story, you know, you got this situation where, um, in the Bible, where God commands Abraham to kill his son Isaac. And God has already made promises that Isaac was going to do all these things and carry on uh, the lineage of Abraham's lineage and result in, in all these wonderful things down through um, the lineage of Isaac. But now God calls Abraham to kill Isaac. And he has to take him up this mountain to, to kill him, to sacrifice Isaac. And so in this famous example, Kierkegaard's struggling with this, he's talking about this, he's writing about this, and he says, you know, what was Abraham thinking when he was walking up that mountain to kill his son Isaac? Kierkegaard, he said, you know, other philosophers are uh, trying to understand reality, they're trying to understand objective truth, but here I am, I'm stuck just trying to understand what's going on in Abraham's mind as he's walking up the mountain to kill his son. That's what my philosophy is focused on. And he uses this example of Abraham to illustrate the internal struggle of life when we're faced with irrational, contradictory experiences. We don't know which direction to go. It seems like there is no solution. Our experiences... In our experiences, we're facing contradictions, things that don't make any sense based on reason and evidence. And the solution, of course, is to take this leap of faith based on what you're passionate about. So he said, Abraham did the right thing. Abraham, driven by his passion, his love for God, chose to believe in a contradiction. He chose to believe against reason and evidence. He chose to believe in the, in the contradiction that killing Isaac somehow won't kill Isaac. Didn't make any sense to him. Reason couldn't figure it out. His experience was just these contradictions, but he chose to just follow his passion, follow his love for God, and take a leap of faith and believe the irrational. That killing Isaac won't kill Isaac. He couldn't explain this to anybody, Abraham. It was such a personal experience, this passion, this love for God. If you would try to explain it rationally, people would just call him insane 
to believe contradictions. And so he was doing something completely contradictory, completely irrational, but he just had to follow his heart. And that's what a leap of faith is. Well, at this point, uh, Kierkegaard breaks, and his philosophy breaks reason and faith apart as enemies. His leap of faith is an overreaction to modernism. And part of the strategy, I think by Kierkegaard and definitely others who came along after him, part of their strategy for understanding faith this way was to try to protect their Christian faith, at least, from being disproven by reason and evidence. Because think about it for a moment. We talked about this with Kant quite a bit. If some people were out there trying to disprove Christianity or disprove your religious belief with reason and evidence and science, well, one way you could defend your belief is just to say, look, my faith isn't based on reason and evidence and science. My faith is just based on my internal passion, what my heart tells me to do. And in that sense, you can protect your faith from being disproven through reason and evidence. But the flip side then would be true as well. If you can't disprove it with reason and evidence, then of course you can't use reason and evidence to try to defend your faith. Nobody can touch it. It's, remember, it's kind of on an upper shelf. You just got to take a leap of faith, put your faith so high that reason and evidence can't touch it because it's based more on what's in here than any sort of fact or evidence out there. So I want to share with you a quote from Thomas Henry Huxley. So T.H. Huxley, as he's referred to often. He lived in the 1800s, and I think he summed up this way of thinking really well. Now, he was a famous agnostic, T.H. Huxley. He was a strong defender of Darwin's theory of evolution. He was the grandfather of Julian and Aldous Huxley. You might remember uh, Aldous Huxley as the author of The Brave New World. So this is his grandfather. T.H. Huxley. All the Huxleys were very well known and famous. He was an agnostic, uh, but he, he critiqued this way of thinking, and I think he critiqued it well. This is what he wrote. He said, there would come a day when faith, religious faith, would be separated from all fact and then faith would go, triumph, go on triumphant forever. So, in other words, the way that we can keep faith, even in the light of all this supposed reason and evidence against it, we can separate faith from fact and then still hold on to our faith. It can't be disproven with reason and evidence because it's about passion and our feelings, not facts. And so even though he was very frustrated with this strategy, because he was an agnostic and you know, didn't like Christianity, he said this, he critiqued this strategy is what they were trying to do. And I think he's exactly right. If you separate your faith from facts, then your faith can go on forever. Because uh, you can believe whatever you want, whatever gives you meaning, even if it's not connected to fact at all. So this way of thinking reduces Christianity to an inward feeling. Now God isn't about objective fact. It's not as though you know, people talk mostly nowadays not about God actually being out there, but about the idea of God helping you in your life. So that's why Francis Schaeffer, his first book, he titled The God Who Is There. Because he was trying to be clear that he's, he's making the claim, at least, that there is a God out there, and he wanted people to understand when he was proposing, when he was proposing God, he wasn't proposing an idea of God that helps you in life. He was proposing that there was an actual God that exists out there. Because most religious God language nowadays in our postmodern culture 
isn't about um, the possibility of a, an actual God being there, but just the idea of God helping you get through life when, when life is tough. So, you know, Kierkegaard could say the same thing as um, Neo did in The Matrix. Why do you believe in Christ? Why do you believe in Jesus? Well, it's because I choose to. See, you can use this strategy for any subjective relative truth, any belief you have that you're passionate about. And that's why people nowadays in our culture will get offended when you say their religion is wrong or if you think that their religious beliefs are false. Because it's not, mostly, religious language isn't used to talk about objective truth. It's, talk, it's to talk about subjective truth, what gives me meaning. So how could you say, you know, if I'm a Buddhist and I believe in Buddhism because that helps me with life, how could you say that that's false? How do you know what I'm passionate about? Because if, if you're saying my Buddhism is false, what you're, how I interpret that as a postmodern thinker is that you're saying it doesn't give me meaning. And how could you know it gives me meaning or not? Um, how could you say my beliefs are false? As people think of religious truth nowadays in this subjective, relative sense. And in that type of environment, the bad guy becomes the person who is arguing that something is objectively true. When somebody stands up now and says, no, what I'm saying, what I'm claiming is really objectively true. Not just true for me, but is actually true. I'm, I'm claiming that there is an actual uh, God out there. Or if somebody claims, you know, Buddhism is objectively true. Not just true for me because it helps me in life, but objectively true. Well, then they're the bad guy because they're saying that only their ideas can be meaningful and, and nobody else's can be meaningful or helpful. So the bad guy is the, is the person who wants to talk about religion in terms of objectively true or false. Okay, Kierkegaard is known as one of the fathers of existentialism. Now, existentialism, technically, and we're going to spend a whole week on existentialism, but technically existentialism was a philosophical movement that took place after World War II. It was really big in the 50s, 60s even, and it continues on today. But a lot of the existentialists, like uh, Sartre and Camus and other existentialists, they would look back to the writings of some key thinkers in the 1800s for their inspiration. So the existentialists in the 1950s after World War II, they would refer back to Kierkegaard as the father of their existentialism, as well as Nietzsche. And so both Kierkegaard and Nietzsche are sometimes referred to as the fathers of existentialism. Even though that term wasn't used by them, it wasn't existentialism as a movement didn't begin until after World War II, but they, the existentialists look back to these guys and their writings for a lot of their ideas. And so they're referred to often as the fathers of existentialism. Next week, we're gonna spend the whole lecture talking about the other major father of existentialism, and that is Friedrich Nietzsche. And it's so interesting, kind of what I was getting at before, that Nietzsche famously is a staunch atheist, and Kierkegaard was a, you know, Christian of some sorts, but their philosophies were the same. And that's kind of my point, is that their philosophies, their anti-reason philosophies were similar their system was similar, and then you could just, you can move in or out the thing that gives them meaning. And so even an atheist and a, some kind of a Christian had the same philosophical system, existentialism, even though one was um, some sort of a Christian and the other one was an atheist. 
Okay, I want to show you a quick video, and I don't know how good this is going to get picked up on the camera, so I'll put a link um, below here on YouTube that you can click on and, and watch the video because I got this video off of YouTube, so I'll give you a link. You can just go and watch it yourself to get a better video and audio quality. But I'm going to play it now for those taking the class here in the room, and this is done uh, really, really well. I, two of my favorite things in life is 8-bit uh, video games and philosophy. And this YouTube channel, I think it's Wisecrack, they made all sorts of videos using 8-bit eight, eight video game graphics to communicate philosophical ideas or philo um, s different philosophers. And so this is a video they put together about Kierkegaard. And it sums up you know, what I've been trying to say for the last hour in a fun, you know, three-minute video. Does rationality make life meaningful? For thousands of years, rationality has been considered the hallmark of truth. For through it, the modern age has given us fast cars, instant food, advanced medicine, immediate communication, and ever giant robots. Okay, maybe not that one yet. But still, the achievements of reason have made most all things in our lives dramatically easier. But to Christian existentialist Soren Kierkegaard, life shouldn't be easy. It should be made more difficult. Whereas his Hegelian contemporaries worship rationality in all areas of life, Kierkegaard contended that reason was only of limited value. Sure, reason makes life more convenient, but it doesn't give us what we really want, to live meaningful lives. And to Kierkegaard, those who live solely by the dictates of reason are under the illusion that they are living meaningful lives. For nothing can define the meaning in my life for me, not even reason. Truth cannot be mediated by society, science, or authority. I must orient myself towards these things. In his verbosely titled book, Concluding Scientific Postscript to the Philosophical Fragments, he rather concisely said that truth is subjectivity. But what does that mean? Let's say you're in a situation in which you deliberate between saving an old man or a princess. Now, you, like most of us, may appeal to reason in order to land on an appropriate course of action. Reason may be a proper guide in making this decision, but ultimately reason is not doing the choosing. You are doing the choosing. To achieve truth, according to Kierkegaard, we mustn't mediate our choices through reason or anything else but instead make a passionate leap of faith towards a decision. Choose from inwardness, from subjectivity. And if, like Kierkegaard, you choose to live a meaningful life through religious devotion, you cannot do so by the dictates of rationality, for reason cannot provide a satisfactory answer to the question of God's existence and nature. So, when faced with such things that are objectively uncertain, one must choose subjectively. No matter how hard it may be, Kierkegaard challenges us not to make choices from purely rational motives, but instead to choose from within. Choose passionately. Make the leap of faith. So one of the reasons I like to show that video is for one reason, just to show, just to prove that I'm not making these things up about Kierkegaard. I mean, they're, clearly they summarized in a couple minutes everything that I've been saying this, in this lecture about Kierkegaard's philosophy. So, but if you don't believe me or the, you know, video, I encourage you to check out Kierkegaard's work himself. You know, don't take my word for it. I don't, I'm 
try my best not to put words in other people's mouths, but um, the only way to really know that for sure is to go read Kierkegaard yourself and see if this is what he really taught or not. Now, I just have a few minutes left, and I want to talk about one other thinker, and that is um, Schleiermacher. And we've talked about him a little bit before, but I wanted to touch base with him again because he is the father of what's known as liberal Christianity. So sometimes people will talk about conservative Christianity, maybe evangelicalism, as opposed to more liberal Christianity. And one of the hallmarks of liberal Christianity is that they believe, um, many of them do, in this type of faith, this, this sort of uh, leap of faith. So even a lot of liberal, and we're not talking about politics here, we're talking about uh, different views of Christianity. So a lot of liberal Christians will flat out say that Christianity is not objectively true. There is no God. Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. Um, Jesus isn't the Son of God. None of those things are objectively true, but we should still believe them in the sense that they give us meaning to life. They give us purpose to life. So I was talking with somebody at the University of Nebraska a couple years ago, and this was a young man who believed in Norse religion, so Norse mythology, Odin, Thor, those sort of things. And I asked him, I said, now, because I just wanted to understand his, his beliefs, right, before I interacted with him, I said, do you believe, you know, there really objectively is an Odin out there or that there is a Thor somewhere in the universe that actually objectively exists? And he says, oh, no, 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 you misunderstand. I just think that those stories of Odin and Thor um, are helpful in guiding my life. They give me meaning and purpose in my life, so to speak. I'm paraphrasing. But that's what he meant when he said he believed in Norse mythology. And he was thinking that I, when I believed in Christianity, that, that I had a similar perspective of my Christian beliefs that I didn't think that there was an objective, you know, trinity or God out there that really existed, but just that the Christian morals, the Christian stories were helpful in guiding my life. Because um, evidently, most of the Christians he had talked with have been more of that way of thinking, liberal Christians. And I said, just to clarify, that's not what I'm claiming. I'm, I'm, I'm actually claiming that there is a God out there objectively. I'm claiming that, I could be wrong, but I want you to at least understand my claim, and you can disagree with me and I might be wrong, but I at least want you to understand my claim so you understand what I'm saying, my, my beliefs. It's different than your beliefs in Norse mythology. I believe that these things are objectively true, and here's why. Here's reasons and evidence that have led me to that conclusion. And we had a great conversation, but we just had to get through that barrier so he knew what I was even saying to begin with. Because in his mind, it was more of this, you know, Kierkegaardian, liberal Christian perspective he thought I was coming from. Okay, so Schleiermacher, um, again, he's in the early 1800s, so there's a sense in which he was part of the Romantic movement. He, you know, and this is a hallmark of liberal Christianity. The Bible doesn't have to be literally true. There's a sense in which they view a lot of liberals, not all of them, but a big part of liberal Christianity is that they understand the Bible to be just one big parable. So like what we would say as conservative, you know, evangelical Christians, we would say, yeah, uh, Jesus taught parables. They weren't objectively true. Right? They were fictional stories that communicated moral truth, maybe. Um, and, and, and they can, you know, fictional stories can do that, of course. They can communicate and teach us things. But we don't think all the Bible is a, is a parable. We think some of the Bible is actually describing objective reality. 
but the a, a liberal Christian understanding would see everything in the Bible as as a parable. Mo, you know, there wasn't an objective real Adam and Eve. There wasn't an objectively real uh, Moses. But they would still, you know, have church and they would sing hymns. And a lot of these, you know, liberal denominations and churches, they do a lot of the same things that is we do as conservative evangelicals, but they don't believe that they're objectively true. They just find that having these beliefs or... <laughs> um, they view it like the young man who looked to Norse mythology. They look to Christianity more for meaning, for helping guide them in their lives like parables do, but they don't believe they're objectively real. And that's why I'm concerned with people like that, that their faith isn't real faith that actually results in salvation because they don't think Jesus is literally real. Uh, they just think the story of Jesus is helpful in guiding our lives. So that's my concern for them or for folks who think that way. And I don't know how far Kierkegaard was down that path. His philosophy was used to develop that path, but I don't know how far Kierkegaard himself was down that path, if that makes sense. So let me just close tonight with a quote from this other thinker, Schleiermacher. Early 1800s, in a sense, part of the Romantic movement as well, reduced Christianity to just an inward feeling or experience. It's true if it provides meaning in your life. And he was celebrated by a lot of Christians because there's a sense in which he, just like Kierkegaard and Kant, they res rescued the faith, rescued Christianity from being rejected or disproven by science and reason and evidence, by the modernists. So here's a quote from Schleiermacher. He said, God, God's not a personal transcendent being. Rather, he's just this infinite spiritual reality that flows through all that exists. So it's, it, in that sense, it's kind of pantheistic. But you'll see he goes on. It's, it's not about objective truth. It's more about our feelings. Christianity isn't about doctrines and beliefs about reality. Rather, it's about the heart. Nurturing the intuitive awareness of being united with and dependent on this world spirit that pervades everything. So he's very clear, and I've read, you know, a lot of Schleiermacher, um, a lot of his work, and he's very clear that faith is, is this feeling of dependence. Uh, that's what faith is. And he was a um, follower of Kant and took Kant's system to the whole nother level. So he fits right into the early 1800s here and all of this um, beginnings of postmodernism. So it's interesting, a lot of this postmodern thinking comes from Christians who are trying to protect their faith in a sense. But by protecting their faith, they actually destroy it because they transform it into something radically different and ends up being not real, true, saving faith at all in the end. All right, let's talk about the class logistics, make sure we're all on the same page. We don't have all that many weeks left. Tonight is October 29th. You had no reading this week, so no reading summaries. Nothing is due today at all. We gave you a couple weeks here to work on your research paper. So hopefully you're making good progress on that. I gave a lecture tonight, mostly on Kierkegaard, touched a little bit on Schleiermacher again. If we move on to the next week, again, no reading, no assignments, because we want to give you time to work on your research paper, which is due then next Thursday on November 5th. So everybody email their paper to Caleb by midnight, November 5th. Those of you taking it online as well, you can look at the syllabus for the details, the length, the requirements for the paper. If you're unsure whether your topic is a good fit for this class or not, um, ask Caleb or I, and uh, we'll tell you. But if it's fairly obvious, just go ahead and start writing it. So it's due November 5th. 
and then we're going to flow through the rest of the semester. Let me glance through and see if there's any big things to note for the rest of the semester. There'll be a little bit more reading, a little bit more reading summaries due. But probably the next big thing you should keep in mind is the final exam and the final paper. So both of those things are due on December 10th. So if you want to look ahead and start planning out your November, planning out the rest of your semester, December 10th is the next big due date for, for major things, assignments in the class. We'll, the final exam will be similar to the midterm, where we'll give it to you the week before, December 3rd. Caleb will email it out, and it'll be open note, open book. You can take as long as you want. It'll be essay, like the midterm. And then that'll be given to you December 3rd. You'll have a week to do it, and then turn it in December 10th. Now also due on December 10th is your final paper. And in that paper is where you'll lay out um, the history of philosophy, right? So the last 2,000, really 2,500 years, 2,500 years of Western thinking. Summarize it. And we'll talk about that paper as we move on in the semester, but you can look at the syllabus for details about the requirements for that historical survey paper, the length, and so on and so forth. Again, if you have any questions about the content, email me. Any questions about the class logistics, email Caleb, the TA. All right.